All right, we'll go ahead and get started. Thanks for joining us today for the first ever Federal Social Media Week. Today is session three, five insider secrets to email marketing. I'm Gabrielle Pret. I'm senior media advisor for the GSA and lead for SocialGov, the federal government's social media community of practice. Today, we will be hearing from Peter Linentine and Victoria Wales of the US General Services Administration to hear about their successes with email marketing and get some insider tips on increasing engagement, newsletter design, promoting social media, and more. Victoria has over 15 years of strategic integrated communications and public affairs experience, eight of which is with the General Services Administration. At GSA's TTS Centers of Excellence, uh, Victoria oversees the brand strategy, digital communications, storytelling, and partnership coordination with customer agencies. She also supports IT enterprise internal communication work streams, including change management and strategic communications for modern workforce solutions. Peter currently serves as the Director for User Experience and Usability for GSA IT. In this role, he oversees the strategic communications training and usability programs for GSA's OCIO. He develops change management initiatives to increase employees' adoption of new technology products, as well as conducts user feedback surveys to analyze the customer's experience and improve overall service delivery. Prior to joining GSA, Peter served as the director for IT planning and policy programs at the Department of Inter Departments of Energy and Homeland Security. He also worked in the private sector, consulting federal CIOs on IT strategic planning and communications, performance management, and investment decision making. And hopefully by now you all know a little bit about me. Again, I'm Gabrielle Pratt. I'm Senior Media Advisor for GSA. I develop omni-channel communication strategies for the agency. I manage our five flagship social media accounts, and I also produce a few newsletters. Um, fun fact about myself, I am a returned Peace Corps volunteer. I served in economic development in Kenya. So a few housekeeping things before we get started. Just a quick reminder that this session is being recorded. Captioning is available and the digital gov link has sent that link in the chat box. If you have any technical issues or you need any help in this session, um, you can direct chat the digital gov team and they can help you. We'll be taking questions at the end, so make sure you send them to the chat box. Um, and remember uh, to take this, the feedback survey after the session is over. So to get started today, we have a couple polls going. Digital Gov, if you want to launch our polls, and I'll read them out loud and then y'all can start voting. On average, how many business related emails do people get on a day? Less than 50, 50 to 99, 100 to 124, or over 125? What do you guys think? Take your votes. Second question, what's considered a good open rate for email? 10%, 20%, 30%, or over 30%? And lastly, what platform device do folks open email from the most? Desktop or mobile? Okay, get your votes in. We got a lot of votes coming in. And if you're having any problem viewing the poll, uh, DigitalGov has that in the chat box as well. So you can chat your answers too. All right. Okay, let's see. So the answer to our first question, people thought on average, how many business related emails do folks get in a day? And most votes, 46% of you said between 50 to 99. Um, then next, 26% uh, of you thought 100 to 124, and 18% of you thought less than 50, and 10% thought over 125. I didn't vote in this, but that's what I'm guessing, over 125. I get a lot of emails every day. Uh, next was what's, what's considered a good open rate for email? 34% of everyone thought who responded thought 20% was a good rate. Next up, 33% thought 10% was a good rate. 19% of you thought 30% was a good rate. And 14% uh, of you who responded said over 30% was a good open rate. And lastly, what platform device do folks open email from the most? 58% of you said mobile. 42% said desktop. So let's see, I'm gonna turn it over now to Peter and Victoria. Tell us more about, uh, so give us some secrets to, to email marketing. 
Thanks, Gabby, and thanks so much, and welcome, everybody. I'm, we're so excited to come chat with you today about the power of email. And I got my um, email chops from um, an awesome team that I served on years ago, USA.gov, who manages um, close to, I think, more than a million uh, subscribers. And I really learned about the power of email through that experience. So as you can see, uh, email is actually your customer experience heavyweight, and we'll tell you a little bit why. So it's a quite powerful tool. I'm sure you all know it's also very intimate. A person has given you their email address. And in some cases, of course, um, subscribers haven't been given a choice per se. So you want to make it worth their while by making your reader the focal point of every message. Throughout our slides, we're going to walk you through um, how empathy drives what we do. Um, first, by respecting the reader's time and by aligning that content strategy accordingly. So we first want to hear, we want to make this session as interactive as possible. What are some emails you love? Um, in the chat, tell us about um, emails you've signed up for that you actually really enjoy getting, that you open, and what about those emails makes you want to open it and read it? So I'm very curious what folks are actually um, sharing in the chat. So Gabby, I don't know if you can pick out some stuff that folks are saying. Yeah, someone said the skim. I think that's a very popular uh, news digest. I myself read uh, Next Draft. That's another very similar style. Um, e, e News, Energy Environment. Um, somebody else said skim. Politico Pulse, that's a good one. Uh, Washington Post has the 202. Atlas Obscura, that's a great one too. NPR, PR Daily News. Great stuff. Boxes future perfect email. Oh, that's a new one. Post 202. Girls Night. Thanks, Dominique. Katie Couric's, Katie Couric's Wake Up Call News Digest. Neighborhood Blogs. I get a lot of those emails from my neighborhood. <laughs> Reagan Great Refinery job. 29. Wow, interesting. I, I get so many of these. Maybe that's why I have so many emails. <laughs> that's probably why you have so many news. emails. Yeah, some of my favorite are like 7.30. Oh, I've got, yeah. I've got a whole bunch. 7.30. So, CNN so, Five Things, that's a new one. Yeah. New Times Daily Briefing, I get that one. Canva, nobody mentioned uh, really good emails. You, got, you guys must get that one. I always open that one. That's a great one too. Um, well, so we have email lovers here, which is awesome. Um, so, uh, but as we know, and as, as uh, Gabby actually mentioned, um, there's definitely email overload, right? We all experience getting too many emails. Um, so this presentation was actually adapted from a workshop that I held a few months ago um, at the FDA's Office of Information Management and Technology, a great group to work with. Um, and in that, that workshop was actually very much inspired by all the great work that GSAIT is doing in this space. So our collaboration is a really great example of how one's team approach can be shared and adapted for another. So you'll hear from my fabulous counterpart um, from that office shortly. So, um, Maybe here we will show some of the answers and how they lined up with what you all told us in the polls. So how many business related emails do people get a, uh, a day on average? More than 125. What do you think industry open rates are for a good email program? 20%, so good job on that. And then I think most of you also answered on mobile, we've got We've got email sages here on this call, so good stuff. So what does email have to do with social media? Well, there are actually common threads and some differences as you can see here. Making messages memorable and catchy to grab the reader's attention, along with communication principles that apply to all forms of messaging. So we are big proponents of, of course, plain language um, and doing the hard work of putting yourself in your reader's shoes. They're not the experts of your content, you are. And you get your message across when you speak their language. You are most effective when you put yourself in their shoes. So for the workshop that I ran, I thought a good way to help the team remember what makes a good email send was to think about it in parts. 
and we came up with a visual to showcase that structure, which is what you see here, um, which is in the anatomy of a good email. And I'll turn it over to Peter to talk a little bit more about what's been done at GSA, GSAIT and their effective strategies using a lot of these, um, this sort of framework. Great, thanks, Victoria. And she's pulling up an example here. One thing that's really interesting, I really love this graphic when I saw um, the slide that she pulled together on the anatomy, because I think it's a good way to think about these emails when we send them. We think about various senses in the body, right? We want them to be fun. We want them to be clear. You know, we want them to be the point. We want them to um, hit home really strongly at times, right? And so as we think about the anatomy, what we did is we started to apply some of this to our weekly in, uh, email. So before I start, I just wanna provide a little bit of background on our weekly newsletter. Um, I have some of my teammate he, teammates here on the call today. Uh, but every Thursday, we send an agency-wide message with uh, three, to short, three to four short technology tips for our employees. So as we were asking those questions about what's your favorite email, I saw that theme, keeping them short, keeping them concise, keeping them fun. Uh, so we, that's what we wanna do. We wanna keep them short so our employees can quickly scan the newsletter to find those topics that are of most interest to them. Uh, over time, we noticed that our readership started to slip a little bit. And so about two years ago, um, our team decided it was time to really refresh and rebrand our weekly email. So on the right hand side, this is one of our examples, you can see some of these changes that we started to implement and how we incorporated them into our recent Thanksgiving edition. Everyone loves a good Thanksgiving themed email, right? So uh, we thought let's try to apply this here to an actual message that we sent. So you can see uh, for the subject line, if we start there, we try to make these every week fun and catchy. Uh, we frequently use emojis to grab the attention of our readers. Uh, we do this because we found research really tells us that people are more likely to open emails when they have an emoji. Now, we also realize that depends on the style, the tone of your message within your own agencies. Uh, but for our message, we try to keep it a little light. Um, you know, we have many serious emails that we receive every day that are very business related. So we want to use this as an opportunity to remind people that you can still have fun at work. And, and bring that sense of fun, that sense of humor into the messages that we send to our readers. We looked at our brand. So we have a new logo. We created a brand for the newsletter as the prior one we felt was starting to look a little dated. So we wanted to keep up to date with the look and feel of our newsletter. And it was a good opportunity to rebrand and relaunch. Uh, we also at the same time recreated the standard header uh, where employees could go for more self-help information, and then they can also register for the training classes that we offer. Our message, we always shoot for a fun, short message, like we said, that people will remember. And, and we have a talented team who brings creativity, visuals, GIFs to our weekly messages that I feel really makes a difference for people wanting to come back and read our messages. Uh, in this one message that you're looking at now, uh, we were highlighting the launch of a background feature in a virtual meeting. Everyone, uh, virtual meetings like we are in today, you have the ability to set your own virtual, uh, your own background. Um, since we knew people weren't going to be traveling that much over the Thanksgiving holiday, we thought it'd be fun to use the background as a way for readers to pretend they still had that opportunity to go to their favorite destination. Um, we also use one call to action. Uh, previously, we had messages where we included multiple links. And you know, what we thought about is we really wanna to try to make it as easy as possible for, for our employees to know what they need to do. Um, if our message is short, we are reinforcing one key point, then that single button makes it really easy for them to select the button and take them to that other supporting set of information if they want to go a little deeper into the content, if they want to watch a video, if they want to go to another website. That's how we've used that call to action button with our readers. And then the final point is our footer. Uh, we provide info um, every week for our readers to be able to reach out to our help desk. So if they need additional assistance, um, they can easily click the button that will take them to the link and direct them to the help desk for that additional outreach with our service desk. We have also recently launched um, a feedback tool. 
And so you'll see that very, there right at the bottom. We're testing that out, but it's a way to have that two-way dialogue with our customers. We think we know what they want to hear. This is a good opportunity for them to tell us whether we are uh, on point for what we want to message to them. This next slide shows a couple other ones that we have done here recently. During COVID, we had an, an opportunity to tell employees how to optimize their telework experience. But again, we wanted it to, to be more engaging. We just didn't want to tell them use the tools, but we wanted to find fun ways to make the messages interesting, memorable. I know in yesterday's uh, session that's similar to today, we talked about dogs, right? Um, TSA highlighted some of their canines. Um, so, I mean, who doesn't love a, a dog? And I know I'm a dog lover myself. So we were highlighting here an example of where um, employees could silence some of the background noise with a feature in one of our virtual meeting tools. We know dogs are also sometimes the culprits in a meeting that they might bark on the sidelines. So we, again, thought that would be fun to introduce that um, into our discussion. Um, on the bottom right hand side of the slide, you'll see another example. We sometimes use tech holidays, these obscure tech holidays that uh, you may not know about, but we use that to fill a slot in an editorial calendar to also add variety to the messaging, making it again fun, but still relevant because it is tech related and it does provide some type of a tech tip to, to our readers. So number two, tip two, uh, that we want to focus on is creating customer-centric content. Um, so again, just like in social media, Victoria was talking about this earlier too, um, you want to develop and publish customer-centric or audience-centric content, of course, right? That is what we want to do every day. We want to focus on what's most important for the customers, what they need to know, and then again, share it in the easiest way for them to understand. So we typically will, will ask ourselves, what do we think our customers' pain points are? What are their challenges? What are the questions that we need to help them answer? And then we develop that content to get that information front and center for them. We also have trainings and focus groups where we have that opportunity to hear from our employees and really understand the, understand the problems that they might be facing with their technology tools. We take the info and something that's been really helpful for us is developing an editorial calendar. And so this really lines up messages that we line up far in advance. And with the calendar, we're not scurrying the week before uh, to, to try to find quality topics to send. But we know based on what we're hearing and the timing of when new, new tools will launch, we can make sure that we're in sync with all those planned deployments uh, across the agency. Um, and Again, since, since uh, people are more likely to embrace what they help build, uh, we are starting to really look at more opportunities to spotlight user-generated content. We've started with this. I think there's opportunities for us to do this more. Uh, but one example when we were looking for a new topic is we recently asked uh, employees to submit their favorite tech hack for a suite of collaboration tools that we use at GSA. So we wanted to hear from them, how are they using those tools in the best way, uh, in the way that they're working? And so this response, it was surprising, it was amazing. I think we received a lot of great ideas and then we turned that around and we highlighted their top three ideas in our weekly email and we cited the employees, recognized them for their contributions uh, with the others who are reading the email. So this again was helping us not only promote the user generated content, but also increasing engagement and again, buy-in from our audience that we were trying to connect with. Customer feedback is another one. I, on the prior slide, we showed you the three red, yellow, green smiley faces that we're starting to test out. Uh, customer feedback is critical for when we're ensuring whether we're sending the right information and whether it's relevant. So we're hoping that we will be able to use that new feedback tool uh, to tell us how we're doing, learn where we can do better, um, and then just hear from our customers where they want to hear more about a certain topic. So again, it's, you know, it's one thing to develop the content, but we also recognize it's really important for us to listen, um, keep our emails relevant, and then also take that final step and show our readers that we're actually listening to them and we're closing the loop. So we're taking the feedback, we're incorporating it into our messages, and then we are making sure that we deliver that in an upcoming uh, email. 
digging into the data. So this one, there is an incredible amount of data, valuable data that we can pull from our email marketing tools. And that's what we do uh, do in order to have these successful communication campaigns. We can send the email, but really when we can dig deep and understand what's happening, that's when we really can start to see how effective we are with our reach in the messages that we send. So we do use our uh, email marketing tool as a way to see what we're doing well and where we can make improvements. We also use this as an opportunity to see who's reading the content. Is the message going and being open primarily from employees in headquarters or do we have that reach out to the employees that are also in the regions and are they looking at these emails that might be coming from us on a weekly basis, or do they look to some of the newsletters that are closer to their location for the content that they need? And that allows us opportunity to, again, reach out to other communication colleagues, others who are sending emails, and collaborate with them to see where we can cross promote. But we also know that our success is measured by more than just our click rates. So we wanna see if we are changing the reader's behavior. So we look at other data points as we are defining the content. Uh, we, if we, for example, were launching a new tool, we want to go and reach out to the technical teams and see if we can look at utilization reports to tell us whether employees are actually using the tool. And we also wanna know, are they reporting any issues? So if they're reporting issues, we know that we need to provide additional communications, additional training and outreach where we can help make that transition easier for them. So we will look at our help desk reports. There's a lot of information in the reports and we can see where they're reporting repeat tickets for tech problems. Uh, and then again, that will help us include uh, information as we go forward and put that into our content. So that information, that data that we're collecting, that feedback from our readers, we're turning that around to then help inform and drive our content strategy. Tip four, selecting a send strategy. Again, your send strategy is so important to the success of an email campaign. We can send emails to everyone. If you remember that, that uh, great graphic that Victoria showed at the very beginning, the overload of the emails that hit us every day. Uh, so we want to be able to target the messages to the recipients who really need to know the information. So we've continued to use targeted segmented messages and sends um, and to make sure also at the time that we're sending the email that it's the best time to grab the attention of our readers. We probably like many on the call today have employees throughout the United States. So we think about the time differences, but we also think about when people are logging in and we might have that opportunity to grab their attention before they jump into a day that's lined up with many meetings that they're trying to balance you know, emails and catching up um, on these incoming weekly newsletters. So we send our newsletter two times on Thursday. Uh, we did a test with this. Uh, we found that sending around the 9 a.m. time frame on a Thursday uh, tends to grab the attention of both East Coasters, and then that starts to trickle as we move to the West Coast. But we also send another email at 2 p.m. on that same day, but only to the individuals that haven't opened the first email. So we don't wanna send it two times to the same people. Um, but instead, we are able to just target the individuals that haven't had a chance to read the email yet, and we remind them that it's in their inbox. And what we found through that test is that it has really helped us maintain close to um, an open rate of about 40% on a weekly basis. So I know that's something our team is really um, proud of, and we want to keep at that 40% open rate, and that sometimes um, is a challenge. So we need to every week continue to think about what our customers want to hear. How can we creatively send that message and in a very fun way to keep that rate um, at, at that level. Um, one thing that we have done also to avoid the email overload is we use a shared calendar for sending messages. So again, across the agencies, we're sending messages. We want to make sure that we're not sending an important message at 9 a.m. and then potentially another group in GSA is sending another important message at 9.30 and someone else sending another one at 11 o'clock. So we do have the shared calendar, which has helped us spread the messages to avoid the overload um, and make sure that we're really grabbing the attention of, of our readers. 
uh, as part of the send strategy too, I'd say it's also important to look at the preferred channel of communication. So um, do your readers prefer an email that's longer with more info? Do they prefer, prefer a short message that then includes a link that points them again to the a video or to a web page? So understanding that is important again as you develop your send strategy um, and that's where again we're bringing in that data we see what users are doing and then we refine that to reflect what that preferred channel is and again whether they prefer to go to a button or whether they prefer to go to a link is just one of the examples as we've developed that strategy and then our final tip as we said, we would leave with five tips today before we have a chance to uh, open it up for questions, is one that you know, is really important. And I think we have such an opportunity as the communicators in an organization uh, to be able to test and try new things. As I said, we get a lot of data to understand what works. Um, but what we have started to do and want to continue to do more is what we call A-B testing. And so what this does, it's the process of taking two versions of an email or two versions of a marketing asset and you measure the difference in the performance of each. So for example, you could give one group one version um, and it might have an email header that is stated in a certain way and it has a different subject line. Um, you might send the other group another subject line that might include an, emo an emoji. You want to see whether that additional emoji in the subject line might grab the attention of a reader. You could also adjust the layout to see what the template looks like and maybe you want to put information at the top or on the side. You can start to see um, through these tests what is really working. Uh, what I would say though as you're doing these tests is just making sure that you don't test multiple things at the same time that can sometimes muddle your experiment and it's really hard to know what change is affecting that outcome. But I'd say again, try it, right? The worst thing that can happen is you find, hey, this didn't work as, as well as what we've done before and you can always return back. Um, but it is a data point, a test in time that can be really helpful as you think about your future email strategy. Another really key, uh, key point that we have learned along the way, and this was one of the poll questions, um, it's really important to test the content before you send it both on the desktop and the mobile version. As more people are using their phones to open messages, uh, what we found is it might look perfect on your desktop, but when you actually go to send it, uh, the, the images or the text might wrap. Um, and so the mobile ver version will not look as clean as it did on the text, uh, I'm sorry, on the, the desktop version. So make sure you have that opportunity before, before you send. Um, so again, as I mentioned, you know, the point of the A-B testing, try something new, see how your readers react. It's a great opportunity. I think this last bullet really sums it up for me um, when we test out new things. Sometimes we'll find the results will go as they're planned, um, or sometimes they won't. And we might think it's a failure, but really I think we're learning a lot along the way that we can then take and incorporate into some of our future messages. So that's our top five. Um, I'm gonna hand it over back to Victoria for a wrap up, I think, before we go into our Q&A. Thanks so much, Peter. You um, hit on so many great points that I'm particularly really passionate about. Um, so as, as Peter mentioned, you know, it's a highly collaborative approach. Um, it's a team sport. Uh, email marketing requires, um, of course, a strategy, a consistent send schedule, just as a few reminders of things that uh, Peter touched, touched on. And again, going back to that empathy piece, serving people with the, the best content possible by doing the hard work of putting yourself in the shoe, in their shoes, not just, you know, looking at the data, but also talking to real people. I love the idea of the feedback at the end of the email messages and also inviting people to send you feedback, but so maybe participating in testing some things too. And, and I love that approach of, you know, having, you know, crowdsourcing um, some hacks and, and then acknowledging them. Those kinds of loops are, are really, really effective. So uh, just some tips here for you all. And we're really looking forward to, to taking your questions. So thanks so much. And if you want to get in touch with us, of course, naturally, it would be email. So here are um, our email addresses um, and I'll turn it over to Gabby. 
That's great. I'm going to chime in with a little bit of a story. Um, you know, on Peter's slide, uh, he had uh, had on his slide, you know, the opposite of success is not failure, it's wisdom. And I, I don't know, that really resonated with me. Um, I have, I produced a few newsletters for the agency. Um, we had one internal newsletter that um, I, I'm, uh, as I had ch put in the chat box, I'm a big fan of News Digest. And I thought, wow, well, we do a daily clips newsletter every day. Um, which gets different kinds of open rates. We have different subscribers. That's something we don't auto subscribe folks to. People have to request to be added to it. So um, I thought, well, wouldn't it be great if we had a daily digest, like a monthly daily, uh, sorry, a monthly digest of news for the agency and something that was really like catchy the way that like 202 or next draft or something. Um, so I had this great idea and I pitched it and then um, got it approved. So I started putting, drafting up this, uh, you know, it was a monthly, um, monthly newsletter and I not only did I do a news digest, but I also included um, some of our speaking engagements. GSA um, leadership does a lot of engagements. We do a lot of things all across the government and we speak at a lot of different events. So I started putting in stuff about um, our speaking engagements. And then I thought, wow, what if we added in what our top social media was? So it became like a media kind of digest. And I thought it was a great product. I loved it. And it was really interesting. We had all, the open rates were all over the board and um, it was it also became really long. That was the other thing. And uh, I think that really affected it. And so we kind of regrouped. I regrouped after probably nine months of putting this together and decided to split my newsletter into um, you know, two different newsletters. Uh, one was the uh, monthly news digest and one was GSA speakers, um, what they had, what kind of engagements they had been doing over the month. And the two open rates uh, for each were wildly different. <laughs> it was so interesting for the news digest. It turns out maybe I'm, we, we only had about a 7% open rate. Um, so I decided to shutter that after a few more months of seeing that it really was not being opened um, enough to, for the effort to put into it. Um, and then the, the speaker's newsletter that I put together, we had some months we had a 70% open rate. Like people really liked to see what people at GSA were doing. It was a very interesting insight into our audience. Um, and I did a little experiment. I thought, what if I hyperlinked everybody's names to like our social posts or to their bio? And that's a, a tip I'll leave you with too. People love clicking on people's names. <laughs> and that was really successful. I went from a low click rate to anybody's, you know, folks would see a name and they wanted to click on it to see more about this person. Um, and that would link to a social post on their engagement or, or something else. Um, so I just wanted to share that experience I have thinking back on like, what is failure? Like, what is a good open rate? And, you know, 7% to me, that was, well, that indicated after having that for consecutive months, having a low open rate that low. Well, let's shutter that and focus you know, attention on a product that really was performing well. Um, so we have some really great questions that came in. I almost want to do another poll to say who was surprised to find out that Peter and the GSAI team puts this together on Gov Delivery, right? <laughs> I think this newsletter looks so sharp and it's so engaging, it's so modern that um, I think a lot of us um, have had some issues getting formatting and Gov Delivery to look like that. Um, and there were some specific questions that had come in about the feedback tool. How do you do that in Gov Delivery, Peter? Yeah, so um, so this is one, and again, this is where I have to give credit to a lot of the team that's on this call today. I have an amazing, talented team that um, brings these ideas. We actually, so this is an example of user-generated feedback as well. We noticed that there was another team within GSA who was testing out this feedback uh, loop in this survey. And so we reached out to them. They're located in Region 5 in um, GSA, and we learned from them. We asked, how are they, how are they doing this? So it's actually a combination of, um, you know, we had um, Marvin and our team took the um, logos and developed them so they could apply into Gov Delivery to build that footer. Uh, the way that it works is you click one of the icons, and it's actually linked to a, a Google form. So that's the combination of tools that we use. So setting it up in Gov Delivery again, it's just one of the tools that we use as an option. Um, 
and I'm sure you could do that in any way, depending on what products that you use within all of your mm -hmm. individual agencies. Uh, but it did take some time. You're right. It does take some massaging to get it to work. But that's what we've done through a combination of those two tools to make that footer footer work. But we'd be happy if anyone has a follow up, you know, would want to talk to the team. Yeah, I, I'm sure I'll be following you up too. Yep. I've become like a resident Gov Delivery MacGyver, figuring <laughs> out like little tics, tips and tricks in it. it def, sometimes it's not very intuitive. So, I mean, I recommend playing around with it. And when you see something in Gov Delivery like find the person who made that yes. newsletter and ask them how they did it. <laughs> we do that as well. We can we do see who, who we can reach out to. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I, I find at our agency, it's a great resource or the other folks who put on newsletters. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. From the Office of Global Health Diplomacy at the Department of State, they're asking how far in advance do you set and distribute your editorial calendar and how often do you normally make edits and updates to it? It's a great question. Yeah. So it's, it's hard to say always, but I would say we have a lineup sometimes three months or more out. Uh, we have a running calendar from January to December. And as we hear from teams that things are coming, we will put a placeholder there. We might not have all the details, but we know mm -hmm. if we're gonna try to highlight three to four topics, then we'll start to put a placeholder to say this week we'll promote this. We know, for example, cybersecurity month happens in October. Mm -hmm. So we always block off the month of October with a series of uh, messages. We also look for content that's out there government wide that we can use. So we don't always have to develop the, uh, the, the messaging, uh, but that's what we typically do. We'll try to lay it out at least three to four months in advance, it, it changes over time and we all understand and we have that flexibility. Uh, but what we do is, on Friday of every week. So tomorrow we'll have the message lined up for what we plan the three or four articles to send out next Thursday. So we have about a week in advance where we finalize the content. We have a round of internal reviews with, um, with the stakeholders and make sure that everything is accurate. And then we'll do some testing in Gov Delivery to make sure everything works from a mobile perspective, from a desktop perspective. And then we'll send that out on Thursday morning. So that's our weekly timeline, but we're planning you know, to that question about three months in advance, I would say is where we are. Uh, Victoria, any thoughts on editorial calendar? Super important. I am a big proponent of editorial and editorial calendars that are flexible, right? So usually what we do is we tier them, right? Um, so if I were to put my, my hat on for a customer agency that we're working on, we talk about uh, bucketing things between like rapid response, routine operations, and then maybe special projects, like how you might um, reflect those on an editorial calendar, giving yourself a little bit of wiggle room to be able to add content and making sure you have the capability if something comes down the, the pike that you can switch something out. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of scheduling emails, you know, ahead of time, but, but being able to unschedule <laughs> is pretty important too. So um, staying on top of that and really staying on top of the what's going on in the ecosystem of things. If you have a scheduled email already, but something happened, you have to be able to react pretty quickly to either pull it, pull it down before it's sent or be ready to send a communication after, uh, after that. Um, you know, who, who hasn't sent an email they didn't mean to, to a bunch of people sometimes too, being really graceful, um, showing some grace for the team and then yourself and saying, okay, here's how we correct it too, right? Um, I also, you know, I really want to make a point about testing. It's so, so important, right? You have to have the ability to try things that inform so much of your strategy. So I know we have a couple more questions. That's great. Yeah. Quite a few things. It's exciting. A lot of questions coming in. Okay, let's go. Uh, there's a, a Gov, well, this might be for Gov delivery credit question. Uh, Stephanie wanted to know, how do you track who didn't open emails? Or do you do that via Gov delivery? Uh, we do. Um, and it's typically for us, we do a roll up count, right? Not mm -hmm. down to the level of, of a user, but um, we can just start to segment to see um, from that report, how did they do for opening the email? Um, also, which link or button mm -hmm. did people click on? So we kind of go to that you know, click through rate to see um, the interest, the, the articles that are of most interest. So we pull all of that through a summary report that we receive after the message goes out. Great. I have a 
a question here from Tracy. She wants to know how often do you distribute your newsletter with new content? Um, so for uh, us, the one that I was talking about in particular, mm -hmm. we send that out, that out every week. So mm -hmm. every Thursday morning, we send that out with typically three to four articles is what okay. we do. And every week that is new content. Mm -hmm. um, what we have found though, so our team also does the training for any tech tools within the agency. And we've created resources for videos, how-to videos, short two minute clips on how to use a tool. So in our back pocket, while we're always um, creating new content every week, we're also thinking about how we can repurpose, right? Mm -hmm. Or maybe bring something back that we promoted six months ago that we know is really interesting. So we brought back a lot of our teleworking news into this period of COVID where we could to use that again to, again, fill the editorial, but keep the content new and different every week. That's great. I have a question here from Danielle. Do you find that people unsubscribe when they receive the same email multiple times? So I'm happy to take that on. Um, yeah. So depending on the strategy, right? I know we talked a lot about internal email marketing, but externally, absolutely. I mean, you want to be really that it goes back to being very intentional in your messaging and making sure you're aware of what is resonating with your audience. You know, people will unsubscribe um, for a variety of reasons. It's difficult to know sometimes mm -hmm. exactly why. You know, they might have woken up grumpy that day. I know if I don't have my coffee, I feel grumpy. I'm like, I don't want this email anymore. I'm like, just kidding. I want to, <laughs> I'm going to resubscribe because I like their stuff. I just didn't happen to like this one. So it could be uh, a number of things. I think in an ideal world, and this is harder to do in government, you'd be able to uh, find out why people are subscribing, right? But it, that's why it's so important to take, um, to, to really look at the metrics too. And an important point on that, tying this all to social media too, you might find when you're doing some, you know, obviously external content to things that are resonating on social media could absolutely be adapted to email. Now I'd, I'd caution folks to make, making sure it's not a lift and shift. You have to be able to, right. you know, customize that content for email, mm -hmm. but you'll find that, and it might or might not resonate. So it depends on the content for sure. Yeah, it's an interesting mention on social media that can definitely, you can look to see what types of posts and content is performing really well and maybe do a little experiment. Does that work for your email marketing as well? I know for the email, the email that I had mentioned, the newsletter I mentioned that I put together, you know, looking at who were the top speakers, like what were the biggest posts of the month, you know, making sure those are kind of upfront in the newsletter I put together. So it's interesting. You can, you can look for insights on your audience and experiment in different ways. I have a great question from Allison here. How do you account for people uh, who open their email just to mark it as read and get it out of their inbox, but they may not have gone through and really read it, valued, or interacted with your content in any way? How, what's your strategy to kind of engage those folks and get them back? So I'd love to hear what Peter has to say about this. <laughs> Such a great question. Um, you know, We're all we're, guilty of it, getting something off our plate. Guilty, right? Save and it for later and we never get back. <laughs> right. I'm like, oh, that's a really great tip. Like, for example, GSAIT sent an email today with an infographic of when to use the best um, uh, video tool for what meetings, right? Yeah. Like, oh, my God, this is so great. And I was going to click on something. Of course, I got distracted by something else and I'll go back to it. So you'll find that your metrics, when you pull them too, you might find you, you wouldn't pull them, you know, on a weekly, maybe, maybe based depending on the campaign, you'll find that folks will go back, you know, um, because those statistics change. Um, I, I'd be curious to hear, you know, how you, how you, you know, if the opens to clicks are, are not correlated um, here and there. So I'm, I'm curious what Peter has to say here. Yeah, and thank you. I see Maria. Actually, Maria is the creator of that wonderful infographic that you talked about, and she's helping answer questions here, Maria Cosio, on our team. So that's helpful. Um, yeah, you know, so what we what we do it is a combination of we realize that right when we send a message out on Thursday, some people might not actually also get around to looking at it until next week, depending on how their schedule looks. Uh, but the other thing that we have found, um, and I see Breeze online here too, is we do Google Analytics, right? So we also take that into account. So you know, she'll help look at um, if we send a message that is pointing to an internal page, as an example, that is within GSA, we can look at the report to say, one, did they click a link? 
but mm -hmm. then how long did they actually stay on the page? So Gabby, I know we've worked with people in your office from the Office of Strategic Communications with working through that to see how long are they staying on a page if we've pushed them there? Mm -hmm. How much are they engaging with that content? So we also can bring that into the analysis. Again, I think there's always opportunities for us to continue to do that even more so, but that gives us the insight to understand whether someone just clicked or whether they clicked and actually stayed on. Did they watch a video or did they just click the video for a second or did they actually watch it through the entire two minutes that we've asked them to, you know, to, to, to look at. Um, so those are some of the things that come to mind in the way that we look at that. And then we also can find whether we're successful by actually seeing, for example, um, if we're encouraging employees to move from one tool to another right? It's not click rates necessarily, but we can look at reports to see, have they started to do that? Have they moved from one tool? We watch that now, you know, the amount of time that someone's on this tool goes down. Mm -hmm. You know, so those reports, kind of non-traditional, you would think about that from maybe a comms perspective of your success. Uh, but if you look at those reports, it really tells us how well we're helping people adopt those tools and make those changes that we want them to, do, to take. That's great. I think we have just a minute, maybe for one last question. Um, Ashley's asking any guidance on whether newsletters like the one that you previewed for GSAIT with multiple formats and sections versus uh, just like an all text email perform better. What do you all think about all text email? You want me to start, Victoria? Yeah. I'll go for it. Um, so I don't know, sometimes it comes to preference, right? <laughs> maybe yeah. here too, as I write it. For my, Myself, I mean, I think what we have found is when we have the visuals in the graphics or an infographic, Victoria, like you mentioned that one that we sent out this morning, I think our readers open those because they're easier to digest. And sometimes I think an all email text is too dense. And myself, if I get a lot of instructions in an email, that's one of the emails that I'll open real quickly and close and say, mm -hmm. I'll get back to it, but I might forget to get back to it. Versus if it's three or four lines with one call to action, click here for more info. It takes me to that more detailed um, website for that information. And so that's how we balance the content. I just personally, when I get one, I know myself, if it's too dense, I we'll save it for later so so that gets to the the cognitive you know piece of it all too we get so much information it's like again goes back to that empathy and respect of what does the reader need to know if we all you know i i was a journalism major in college it's like a little bit of the pyramid right the lead and you know making sure mm -hmm. that that people are getting the gist of of things without um overwhelming them with content i think text could be very effective or but i i could not agree more. If there's a ton of instructions in something, I'll get lost or I'll get back to it. Um, that's the also the, the beauty of email. You, it can be kept for later reference, unlike social media, unless you save it to some extent or take a screenshot, there's some value there too. And that's why the testing piece is so important. It's also really important for 508 compliance um, and general um, accessibility to make sure that you're serving everyone um, and, and you're, you're making sure good design, as they say, is accessible. So that's also really important. So I know we have a lot of other questions too that I'm not sure if we're gonna be able to get to, but that's mm -hmm. why I put my email in the chat box. If anyone wants to connect, I'd, I'd be happy to. Yeah, that's great. Please connect with us after the session. I know we had a couple chat questions about external audiences as well. And I know, uh, Victoria, you do a lot of external and I, a few of my newsletters are external as well, but I think a lot of the principles here, um, you know, especially from the GSA IT, like with design and reaching your audience, I think those are universal, whether you're looking internal to your audience or you're communicating with a lot of different external audiences. Uh, one tip I'll leave you all with for external audiences, in particular with working for Gov Delivery, is making sure you have your, your audience, your uh, topic list, uh, you know, segmented. I know that when we, uh, I took a look at our press release distribution a couple years ago and we had all of our emails, all, all of our audience was like on one subscriber list and I went through and pulled out kind of strategically like top tier press, local trade publications, who was a GSA employee subscribing, who were other, other you know, citizens subscribing so that we could kind of segment our audience to look, you know, if a if we got a 50% open rate, that's great. We expect that for employees, but for top tier press outlets, like what would be a good open rate? 
it's about 15%. Or with trade public gov trade publications having an open rate that's like 30, 40%, that's much better. Each one is going to be different for each group. There's a that's an, one external tip that I can leave you all with. Um, so I think we'll go ahead and wrap up now. If you have any questions for myself, Peter, or Victoria, you can uh, send us an email. I hope that um, you will be signing up for the other sessions we have going on this week. Uh, today at three o'clock, we're gonna be hearing from our friend Tanner at the Department of Veterans Affairs about uh, what's, what's going on, what's new in podcasting. Um, so everyone take care and we'll be talking to you soon. Thank you very much, Peter. Thanks, Victoria.